Kevin says music helped him learn how to live again. By 1993, he was determined to have a career in music. He sang at high schools, weddings, and even funerals. I was just looking for any avenue. So I was still singing a lot of different styles of music, but uh, primarily, any time I sang what I wanted to, it, it was country. It was country music. In 1993, Kevin began performing at the Great America Theme Park in California. There, he primarily sang pop tunes and occasionally threw in a few country classics. But Kevin wanted more. He bought himself a karaoke machine and taped his own music. He wanted to land a record deal. The recording was so bad, but I sent that tape out to everybody I knew. And so uh, I sent it out, this tape, and said, if you want to send back a $5 donation for the cost of the tape, you know, I would appreciate it to buy some music equipment. And so I actually ended up getting a lot of money from friends and family. Kevin made enough money from selling his karaoke tapes to start a singing telegram business. Still, his career was going nowhere. He eventually sought advice from his dear friend, David Foster. David was always the last because we had built a friendship. I never wanted to impose on that. And uh, not only did I not want to impose on David, but I, I was actually afraid of his opinion. Well, here's the thing. I mean, had they told me that he wanted to be a singer, I would have never agreed to see him, ever. Every time I go out, somebody walks up and gives me a tape. And, um, you know, you just can't do anything with it. And 90, 999 times out of 1,000, they're not good. Kevin started sending me demo tapes, but I thought he wanted to be a pop singer. In other words, he wanted to compete with Michael Bolton and Barry Manilow and, and um, Michael Jack, you know, the pop singers. And he clearly didn't have the voice for me. I was trying to be encouraging, you know, keep it up, man, keep trying, you know. He doesn't lie. <laughs> Not when it comes to music. It's either he likes it or he doesn't, and he'll tell you why he doesn't. And that's what makes him so incredible. But uh, he really sincerely thought I stunk. If he tells you any different, it's lying. <laughs> Kevin appreciated David's advice, but he was still determined to land a record deal. He built a studio in his garage in order to produce higher quality demo tapes. This time, he recorded only country songs. He sent one tape to the Nashville Network, where he was invited to audition for the show, You Can Be a Star. Kevin also delivered his new demo tape to David Foster, who at the time was in his Malibu studio recording with Kenny Rogers. He sent me a demo. <clears throat> and I put it on and it was country music and you know the, the twanging guitar started out and I, I said well I must have the wrong tape but I left it in long enough to hear this voice and it was great and I went oh my god this kid has been holding out on me all these this has been like a couple of years now the next day Kenny Rogers heard Kevin's demo and was impressed both Kenny and David used their contacts to try to get Kevin a record deal, but nobody was interested. For two years, Kevin's demo sat in a box in David Foster's studio. Then in 1995, A&R record executive James Foster, David's sister, went through David's box of rejected demos and discovered Kevin's tape. My sister says, I know this great country producer named Chris Farron. I said, oh, yeah, I know Chris. He's great. He does Dina, Dina Carter and Boy Howdy, and he's, he's really happening. She says, well, maybe I can get him interested in working with Kevin, doing having Kevin sing a demo or two for him, and maybe he'll like him. And then, so she gets all fired up. Kevin traveled to Los Angeles to meet with record producer Chris Farron. Kevin performed a few songs off his demo. Everyone in the studio was moved by his soulful voice. Maybe five or ten minutes into our first meeting together I just said boy there's something special about this kid there's something beyond the obvious I just know it was an immediate transformation for me from having met him to going wow I'm ready to lay down in front of a train for this guy 
Chris Farron was eager to showcase Kevin's music. Three months later, Kevin sang for Asylum record executive Kyle Lenning. The thing that really spurred me to sign him was just the, the character in his voice, the sort of sense of communication that I got from him immediately, that there was a soulful quality and just just something besides the lyric and the melody that was being expressed with when he sang. Kyle Lenning gave Kevin a development deal with Asylum Records. Now the budding singer needed a hit song to ignite his career. At the time, the song Nobody Knows by the Tony Rich Project was doing well on the R&B charts. The producers backing Kevin believed the song would also make a great country record. Nobody had to convince Kevin to record the song. The lyrics touched a special chord with him. story about someone that uh, was having a hard time communicating and, and telling others how he felt and, and feeling alone and um, for so long through my illness I felt that way and I just didn't know how to put it to words there was such a flurry of activity around uh, our record company at that time and just with him in general he had a, a real shot with a very special song and with Kevin's personality uh, it did pay off the song comes out and goes to number one I mean it's like a fairy tale it's like I just couldn't believe the transformation you have seen this star being born I'm just it's just an amazing story and it ain't over yet Kevin's career was far from over nobody knows soared to number one on the country billboard chart and stayed there four straight weeks in a row. Kevin Sharp's painful past gave him the strength and courage to tough it out in the competitive world of country music. Now, he was on the fast road to success.